early. I love that about the church. We don't have to wait till January. Yeah, we, get to, we get to jump right in early. Now, as we were talking about that, um, and this is, I'll, segue, I'll start segueing into my message now, but um, I had this picture when we were in pre-service prayer, and uh, we, I, I was just praying about uh, Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of a new year, and I, I know that so many of us are ready for new things. Are you ready for some new things? I don't know about you, but the last couple of years, last three years have been very challenging and very difficult. And I think many of us are ready for a new era to begin. And so I was just praying about that. And, um, you know, there's one of the things that we'll touch on on Rosh Hashanah is about the sealing of the books. And it's believed on Rosh Hashanah that God, that you can have your, during the season of uh, the 10 days of awe that God opens the book and it's a time of reflection. What, Lord, what, how has the past year been? And we're going to, and then we're going to pray that we will be ascribed into God's books before the day of atonement. Because in the Day of Atonement in, Ju- in Judaism, God closes the books, and you need your name written in the book. Well, I started thinking about that, and there's, if you, how many, do we have any accountants in here? Anybody that is, yeah, see, I've got one back there. Uh, I, I have vic- vicariously become an accountant, and uh, the surprise of my life, even though my grandfather was a, a, a CPA and my dad was in royalty accounting in the music business, I, I have found myself being... In, drawing on those strengths here in the last several years, and that's okay. But there's a term in accounting that we use called closing the books. And the thing about closing the books is, is it's not just a stopping point and a starting point. It's so that you have a fresh start. It's closing the books on everything from the past 12 months, and it gives you a fresh start so that what has happened in the past 12 months doesn't play into the picture of what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Okay? So I think prophetically there's some things that God wants to do during this time frame. He wants to bring closure to some books and give you a fresh start. This is the mercy of God. Some of, some, for some of you, life has been very challenging and very hard. And the Lord says at the beginning of a new year or a fiscal year, we're going to close the books on that year And we're going to have a fresh start to be able to look and see what the next year has in store. So I want you to be excited about that. Are you excited about this coming year? And are you excited you don't have to wait till January for it to start? Yes, I am too. All right, so let's move into to my message. Uh, I was asking the Lord, uh, I I know the last couple of weeks we've had to come to you with some some kind of not so good news just about the, the financial state of our ministry. And my, my only my concern with that, and, and most pastors' concern with that, is that our people get left feeling like we're we're whipping the the whip. You know, we need more money, and I don't ever want that to be the case because we trust the Lord for that. But we have from from time to time have to bring teaching on what God's uh, order is for your households and how He has set up the economics. And I'm going to tell you, Pastor Jason blew it out of the park last week on his teaching on uh, on that. So. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to listen to that, I, I, I think it was, for me, it was uh, probably one of his top three messages ever. It was just so well done. And so if go back and listen to that. Uh, I felt like the Lord said on the heels of having to come to you with so much, I, I don't want to say bad news, but just say real news, okay? It's just real, just like it is in your house. That today I, I wasn't to overburden you with more of that, but I was to bring a message of encouragement and of hope. And he has completely confirmed that through our prophetic flow time and the worship set. Because I don't talk to the worship team about the worship set. So God is wanting us to go to a new place of hope and in faith, even in the midst of a very challenging time. We're going to close the books on the challenging time that most of us have had, and we're going to prepare our hearts for a new beginning into better things. Are you ready for some better things? I am. I don't know about you. I'm ready for some better things. So I asked the Lord where he wanted, wanted me to land on this, and, and uh, I want to start, and I'm, I'm really going to focus in Hebrews chapter 6. My, the entirety of my message, except for maybe a closing passage, will come from Ephi, or, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, the entire chapter. I'm going to break it down word for word, line for line, precept by precept. So for those of you that are 
uh, want to be theologians and students of the word, I'll break this down for you word for word. But I do think that in breaking it down, I believe it has significant practical application for where you are and where Eastgate is in this period of time. Let me give you a, start with a little bit of history because I, I, I'm a history buff and I love to have, when I read the scriptures, I like to have a context for what this is about because I think when, I have, when we have a context for what, these, what, I'm, what I'm to share, it's easier for us to draw practical application to it today. It's, and otherwise, it just becomes words on a page and we try to find application for it. But let me give you the scene here. Hebrews uh, was written uh, to a community of Hebrew or Jewish believers. They had believed in the message of the gospel. They had received Jesus as Messiah and Savior, but they were Jewish. And that's hence why it's, the, the book is called Hebrews. It's a, it was a letter written to a community of Hebrews or Jewish believers in, in Jesus. It was written during a time frame. I, I always like to know time frames because you can't really contextually draw the message out unless you know what's going on. The time frame of this book, most scholars believe it happened before the fall of the temple in 70 AD. And the reason we, we, they believe that and we believe that is because there's a lot of references in the book of Hebrews about um, the sacrifices and taking sacrifices to the temple. And they speak to those, when you read that, those, those passages in chapters 5 and 7 and in, uh, 10 and 13, when you read about there, they're written in the present tense. So we know that there was still this, this the idea of taking a sacrifice to the temple was still in existence. So this book has to be, this letter has to have been written sometime before the fall of the temple in 70 AD. Do you follow that? Okay. So we know that. That's, that's real important. Because, and then you say, well, Pastor, why is that important? What we know of through history is that that was a very difficult time in Jerusalem. Uh, the Roman Empire was just crushing it. They were, they were, it was just, it was just a very challenging time. And it was because it was the, the days leading up to the actual destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So there was a lot of persecution. Uh, there, were, there were a lot, especially among uh, Jews who had received Messiah, there was a lot of persecution. There was just, people were, were being killed, uh, people were being run out of their houses. It was just a very challenging time. And I, I emphasize that because it's important for us to understand if we're going to apply what I'm going to read later in this, from this chapter, that, that it, there, these people were under, were under very difficult times. How many of you are in the middle of difficult times right now? I, th I think everybody, if we were honest, there's some place where it's a challenge. Well, I, I want you to understand that what I'm reading is, was, was, was written to a people who were very challenged and going through a very difficult time, okay? Uh, I have in here, um, and I, I got ahead of myself, but written to a community who worshiped in a synagogue, not at the temple. So we can draw from that that they were probably not in close proximity to Jerusalem. They may have been maybe even in another, they could have been in another country. They could have been in Asia Minor. They could have been in Italy. They could have been anywhere. They could have been in Egypt. We don't really know for sure from, from this because we don't even know the, who the author is actually. So, um, so but the re there's references to the synagogue, and that's why it can maybe help you draw some context to maybe Hebrews chapter 10 and 20. 3, 24, and 25 about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, okay, as is the habit of some. They were in, a, they were in probably a more of a remote area, and so they need, there was, instead of a temple being there, there was a small church, maybe like this church, okay? Um, I already said written time, during a time of great persecution, uh, and then um, verse 5, this is, this is probably, it's probably written to a a demographic of brand new believers, possibly even the very first generation of believers who didn't actually witness the works of Jesus. So these were believers just like us who came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ based on a message from someone else, not based on actually having witnessed the ministry of Jesus. Does that make sense? So these are like the first generations of believers who believed based on a message. And I find that pretty amazing because we can, that, that's us. 
Every one of us, none of us were there when Jesus was doing those miracles, but we have believed based upon the message that someone shared with us. So we are very much like the audience that this letter is written to, okay? And I want you to, I I wanted to say that because sometimes I think we read scripture and we say, well, you know, that was way back then and I don't really have any connection to that. Well, I, I hope I've laid out enough of a case through giving you some historical context to understand that these are people just like you and me going through very challenging times and who are believing on a message that's been shared with them, not one that they personally witnessed. Have I done that? Have I convinced you? Okay, so now you know all about Hebrews. Now I challenge you to go read the entire book of Hebrews from that perspective, okay? For those of you that are real, real students of the word, we're actually going to be in this, in this book um, a little bit on Rosh Hashanah. We, some, we, we, we draw some of our teaching for Rosh Hashanah out of the book of Hebrews. Okay, so back to chapter 6 of Hebrews. I'm literally going to go through this line by line because I think there's some important things the Lord wants to say to you today. When we, let me just read. Um, I'll read a few verses at a time, and then I'll, I'll break it apart for us. So I'm in Hebrews 6, starting in verse 1, and I'm going to go through um, uh, the first three verses first. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works or of faith towards God or instruction about washings and laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Okay, we got to stop there. Because this, <laughs> the writer is saying these are the elementary things. And I'm going to tell you most churches don't even get to most of that. Sad. But the writer of Hebrews is saying these are the elementary things and that we need to mature beyond these things. So the first thing I felt the Holy Spirit say as I was breaking this down was there's a call to maturity. There, there is a, during this season, there's going to be a call to maturity beyond the fundamental basic things that we know about our faith, the things that we would all agree on. There's going to be a, there's going to be a need for maturity. Now, what was this maturity for? Because, again, I want to paint the picture. This group of people were under tremendous persecution, and it, wasn't nece- it was necessary for them to lay a foundation of these truths, but how do we mature beyond understanding the truths? We have the truths tested. We have to learn to apply. We have to learn to not just know the truths, but we have to add them to our lives. That's what causes maturity. Not, maturity is not just knowing the, the message. It's about being or becoming the message. And that's what the writer of Hebrews was telling them. It's time to do the stuff. It's time to, for, me to, for, for us to stop talking about it and get out and do the stuff like what Rod was talking about. He's finally opened the door, he, the, he's opened the door of faith to his life to go out and start sharing his faith. Okay? So we've got to mature. That's how you mature. Not just knowing the stuff, but doing the stuff. And it's, it's, it's a little frightening. How, can you imagine these people thinking, well, I don't want to I don't want to leave my doors. I'm afraid they're going to find out I'm a follower of Jesus and they're going to kill me. That's what was going on during this time. Well, we don't have quite that. We don't have it quite that bad, folks. We're not living in an area of the world where us sharing our faith and being bold about our faith and bold about what God has done in our lives is going to wind us up in prison or get us killed. Now, if, if some things don't change, it's, it could potentially head in that direction, unfortunately, for America. But right now, we enjoy the freedom and the liberty that, we, that we've ha- enjoyed since the inception of our country to be able to freely share and to be able to go out and boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord without risking our lives, okay? So this call, what the Lord is saying to you today, where are you, where are you in your walk with me, and where is time to go higher, it's time to go higher. It's time to mature. It's time to take all those things you know and put them into play. Are you ready to do that? Church, are you ready to do that? We've got to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word of God. 
Okay, now let's look at verses 4 through 7. For, let's see, let me, did I read all that? For, uh, okay, let's, let me just recap this last part because I, I don't think I read verse 3. And this we will do if God permits. So there's, we have to walk within the will of God as we're living out uh, the, uh, the instructions um, in, verse, in verse 2 there. We do those things as God permits, but we have to live. We have to live and be out there doing these things. Verse 4 says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. Now, this, this is a, this is a um, there's a lot we can unpack here, but I want to say this. The key part of this is the falling away. We came to you two weeks ago, Pastor Laura and I did, and, and, and shared some, statist- some statistics with you about where the church of God is in the earth right now. And it's statistically, the church of Jesus Christ is in decline. Secularism is on the rise. And the church of, of Jesus, I'm not saying the church is, but people who, who know better are, are not supporting the church. They're not coming to church anymore. They, 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 they have found a way to try to live and survive without the precepts of God, without the truths of God. And we see this secularism creeping into our churches. And so what he's saying here, it, it's, you're going to have to be mature or you're going to fall away. Now, falling away can look like a number of things. In this passage, he's really talking about people who have tasted of the goodness of God, who received the message of Jesus Christ, and then for whatever reason, no longer followed Jesus, whether that be through persecution or fear, or whether that be through just, you know, laziness or whatever. Uh, It could be anything. But there was a falling away. Now, he goes on to say some pretty strong words here that it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Does this mean that they are eternally condemned? Uh, That's probably a good theological debate. And some of you are probably asking, I need to know this. I know my, look, I'm at my son Jude right now, and I know because he and I have these conversations. Does that mean if somebody falls away, they are eternally damned and can no longer come back? And then I, I immediately, my mind goes to the, the passage where it says, you know, if you uh, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, uh, you can't be forgiven. So there's some pretty strong language theologically about this falling away that we need to be very sober with and sober to. Uh, I, I don't know that I can draw you in a very accurate, perfect theological statement on that, except this. Follow Jesus and keep growing don't fall away because I can't guarantee you theologically that if you fall away that you're ever going to be able to get back. Now, I do believe our God is merciful. He is, he is merciful, but he is also judge, and he is looking for a spotless bride. And if we water down the message of the gospel and we just rely on, oh, God will forgive me, what, you, what you're basically doing is what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. You continually put Jesus back on the cross. You're constantly, you're not maturing, you're not growing. You're just constantly relying on the mercy of God and causing the, and just constantly putting Jesus back on that cross. Jesus went to the cross once and for all. And our response to that is to receive that beautiful message of salvation and to grow from there, not keep going back to the cross. That's what, the, that's what he's saying. There's, there's a process of maturity that you have to move into that, and not just keep coming back to the cross. That's what he that re- reemphasizes this first part of this. We've got to move on from just repentance. We've got to move on into maturity. We've got to be faithful. We've got to be diligent. We've got to become disciples. Then he goes into verse 7 and 8, and I love this. It's kind of, a, kind of poetic but it's pictorial, and I love that. It says this. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, 
and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it was also tilled receives a blessing from God. I'm going to read that again. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from the Lord. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed. And it ends up being burned. So he reemphasizes what he has just said, and he puts it in kind of a prophetic picture of your and my life as a field. And I would ask you this morning, what does your field yield? What does your field yield? Some of you, your fields are still bare. Some of your fields have never put seed in, it, seed in them. But God is looking for fields that bear fruit. Not just know that they can, but are actually bearing fruit. What does your field yield? Is it yielding vegetation? Is life sustaining? Is it, is it bearing spiritual fruit? Is blessing those around you? Is blessing your life and blessing those around you? Or is it yielding thorns and thistles? And is it worthless and close to being cursed? And it ends up being burned. Very sober words. So there's this, this call, this, this, in the midst of great persecution, this congregation of believers, this is written to, he addresses the reality of what's going on in the world, the persecution, and he's calling them up. And God is calling us up today. He's saying, take a look at your heart. Take a look at the fields and the soils of your life. What are you producing? It's time to come up. It's time to be blessed. It's time to resist and continue seeing your crops cursed. 